Well, thank you, DJ Steve, for keeping up our energy during our lunchtime break. I'm really excited for us to now uh, join with uh, Senator Connie Leva and Catalina Cifuentes to talk about uh, access to education in our region. Uh, first, let me uh, introduce both of them. So Senator Connie Leva, she represents the 20th State Senate District and was reelected in 2018. This district includes the cities and communities of Bloomington, Chino, Colton, Fontana, Grand Terrace, Montclair, Muscoy, Ontario, Pomona, Rialto, and San Bernardino. As a state senator, she has been committed to improving California's schools, the environment, and communities, as well as creating quality jobs throughout the 20th State Senate District and the state of California. She firmly believes that California families benefit most when we invest in and help strengthen small businesses and other job drivers that create good paying jobs in our local communities. She was raised in Chino and has lived in the Inland Empire since she was a small child. She attended local schools and graduated from the University of Redlands with a bachelor's degree in communicative disorders. And they current, her and her husband currently still live in Chino. And then we also have joining us Catalina Cifuentes. She's the executive director of college and career readiness for the Riverside County Office of Education. And she is a California governor appointed commissioner and chair for the California Student Aid Commission. Catalina also serves on various local, regional, state, and national committees to make sure she has a voice in the decisions that affect our students' access to quality education and a promising future. As a first-generation college student, Catalina strives to show the impact that can be made when educators have high expectations for all students and when students pursue their post-secondary dreams, regardless of the odds against them. We are very excited that both of them could take some time to join us and uh, share their perspective on education and the future of education and what the current legislative structure looks like. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lucas to get us started. Thank you. Hello, Senator Leva. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's such an honor to be here with you and to be able to have a conversation with such a fierce advocate for college affordability, access to higher education for all students, all Californians, California students. So thank you so much for being here. Um, it's yeah. a okay, so we are going today, you know, our focus is definitely around college affordability to talk about your passion and the work, the years of work. You've been a strong partner, continuous partner with the California Student Aid Commission to really focus on um, updating policies and, and programs for students and to, to address all the access and equity barriers for some of our students. And so late, lately you've been working on Assembly Bill 1456 and to really streamline Cal grants for California students. So can you share a little bit about what kind of led you to be the co-author and this isn't your first opportunity. You've, you've brought Senate Bill uh, 291 to help improve access for community college students. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Catalina, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Education has really turned into my passion uh, because we know it's the great equalizer. Uh, AB 1456 really started with, as you said, roots in SB 291. What I love about my job in the legislature is when you are a problem is brought to you, you have the opportunity to try and fix it. So as the chair of Senate Ed, it was brought to my attention that many of our community college students we're paying as much or more than our CSU and UC students when you look at the total cost of college. So we worked on 291 for two years and then and that was, it was introduced just before COVID hit. And so rightly so, we really shelved any bill that didn't have to do strictly with COVID and keeping people safe. So when assembly member uh, Medina came to me and asked me if I would want to be a co-author and start the same bill, over in the assembly, I said, absolutely. Uh, it's not about whose name is on the bill. It's about actually getting the work done. So I'm very excited about this bill, uh, making sure that we're streamlining Cal grants. And it's really, it, uh, it's long overdue to make sure that our students have monies for non-tuition costs because the tuition sometimes is the easiest part, right? And it is the most affordable part. But do you have a place to live? Do you, Can you afford to 
to buy your books. So there's so many things, um, even just getting to school. Do you have a car? Do you have public, need tra public transportation? So this bill will really actually help with all of that. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we can get it to the governor's desk. Uh, we're doing the appropriations uh, dump as they call it today. So hopefully it gets out of appropriations and it will come to the Senate floor and I'll be able to advocate for it and hopefully get it to the governor's desk. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> and you have, you know, this is like you mentioned earlier, just your passion and what you believe in is if you understand the power of education and when we're, you mentioned and shared and it's something so many, if you're not involved, the cost of attendance is, you know, California, they say in the nation, we're very generous about taking care of our students and pay tuition and fees, but it's those other costs um, of affordability, um, housing insecurities and food insecurities. So what other ideas or, or things are you thinking in addition to help um, streamline these processes for students? So when we talk about streamlining processes, I think you're thinking about how do we get students into college and then what's their, once they're there, um, how do we help them? So I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, I think that if we had a coordinating body, that would be very helpful around higher education. But I think really the legislature has kind of served as that coordinating body and we have really tried to, to streamline the process in a number of ways. Um, a bill that I just love that got absorbed into the budget is SB 309. Again, I go back to the great part about my job is when you learn of a problem, you have the ability and the opportunity to change it. So we found out that um, not all of our uh, uh, high schools were offering A through G courses. A through G is, you know, specific English, math, science classes. And if you don't take them, you cannot get into a UC or a CSU in California. 50.6% of the students in California did not have access, do not have access to A through G courses. I found that shocking. And I also found it very disheartening because we also know that those students who don't have access are really in, they're in our black and brown communities. And to me, that's just unacceptable. So we introduced SB 309 to make sure that the money would be there because you need particular teachers to teach those classes and make sure that they were there. So uh, I'm happy to say that got, it got absorbed into the budget and we will now be putting $547.5 million uh, to help students have access to A through G classes, which I just feel like this is something we have to make sure that every one of our students reaches their potential so can you imagine being a student maybe you're the valedictorian of your class you have a 4.0 and you graduate and realize that you didn't have access to these classes and can't get into a csu or uc that's just unacceptable so very excited that uh, that's going to be in the budget and we're going to change that going forward another way that we can streamline um, processes for students is ab 1111 which is authored by assembly member uh, berman and it aligns community college courses uh, so that students transferring uh, to a four-year institution and they're enrolled in maybe multiple community colleges and they're meeting the necessary course requirements so that's kind of one that um, seems easy and seems logical but we aren't doing it so hopefully ab 1111 gets to the governor's desk and is signed because i think that will help students tremendously and then additionally ab 705 which was authored by assembly member Irwin in 2017 it changed our remediation policies so the community college students are accurately placed into college level coursework uh, without having to take additional prerequisite courses that's another one that i had no idea that this was a problem so I think those are some of the things that the legislature is doing to try and help streamline things and just make it easier for students or, you know, young people and not so young people, maybe folks that are changing careers. Well, thank you. And you gave an, an example and some may think, how does that happen? How does a student that's top in their class not meet a requirement? And I'm here to say to you, yes, it does happen. I, I see thousands of transcripts um, in Riverside County and it happens. And so um, just thank you for that and the continued push of courses of rigor. And ultimately we want them to be eligible for use of the CSU, but we also want them to be prepared for a community college or an apprenticeship program and have those academic skills and math and science to be able to be successful. That's so, right. Thank you. And you, 
shared already a little bit about um, you know what I know with the conversations happening in Sacramento with you know P20 and unifying us as one one P20 system and not just K12 and higher ed and can you share a little bit about the, your your goals or ideas for that strong and improving that articulation because you've done so much you just talked about two examples of how you know you're working with higher ed and K12 and trying to unify them can you talk a little bit about that articulation ideas or what your thoughts are meaning from um elementary school and Fort all the way through college yeah. yes yeah like you did a through g and higher ed yes yeah I think we don't do a great job of it, to be perfectly honest. I think we have so much work to do. Um, I'll just use a personal example. I think it, years ago we started trying, this was way before I ever ran for the legislature. I remember when my twins went to college, excuse me, went to um, elementary school and they were in kindergarten and each um, classroom was a different college. And so they were the University of Laverne, which is a school down in Southern California. And so this was just a way, and this was 25 years ago to start young people, children, thinking about going to college. Uh, and so, But it's it's worked to some degree, but I think what we also don't do really well is we don't talk about two things that students can do. You might be college bound, absolutely, but what about career technical education? That is so important as well. And we wanna make sure that we give all the, the students all the tools that they they need to be successful uh, in life. But to, to your actual question, I don't think we do a good job um, you know, as, as I said, and you reiterated the um, A through G courses, they're just not happening now. Hopefully those will be happening uh, to help with that. But I think a lot of it comes down to parental involvement. How do we involve our parents? But I also I came out of labor. I know that so many parents are working full time and they're working one and two and three jobs. So they don't have time to uh, to make sure that everything's happening. They assume that the school is doing it and the school should be doing it. We need to make sure we have more counselors in you know middle school and make sure that our they're they're focusing the students the way they need to be focused because mom and dad, you know, you're very lucky if you as a child if you have mom and dad that can be there and volunteer in the classroom. Um, but it just doesn't always happen. And it's not because those parents don't love their children any, any less. It's because they're working two and three jobs. So I think really having the resources at the elementary schools and the middle schools with counselors to keep our young people on track will help get them into community college, into our UCs, CSUs, and also into our trade schools and our career technical education programs. We want to give them every, every possible way to succeed. Awesome. Well, you you shared something, and I think it's it's what we have to accept and realize in California public schools, more than 60% of our students are either low income, receiving free and reduced lunch. So they're what you just described as institution dependent. And that's yeah. what we're trying to build is parents think we're taking care of it. So let's yes. can take care of it. So we can take care of our students within the school system. So I think that's awesome. And I think especially in the Inland Empire. Um, those numbers are even higher. Some of our some of our schools have more than ninety percent of their students that are school dependent. So I I love that message and that understanding. If you, you know if you work in an empire, that's what who you're working for. These parents trust you. They're right. they're in the fields. They're working two jobs. They're doing what they can to keep food on the table, and they're trusting the schools as professionals to help their students. Yes, thank you, Catalina, because that <laughs> totally get it. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So it is incumbent upon us as a legislature mm -hmm. to make sure that that's happening, making sure that we are giving the schools the funding that they need, and then also holding them accountable and making sure that they are spending that money on those counselors and making sure the students have everything that they need. So you're exactly right. Well, and you're, you're not only just college affordability champion, but really about policies that provide equity for all students. And so with the pass, when the governor's budget to um, ensure students submit, uh, uh, schools help students submit their FAFSA applications starting a year from now, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas and and how are you, how, I'm sure you're excited about that because you're definitely an equity champion for that. You deserve, you feel every student deserves those opportunities. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts about that. 
Absolutely. Oh my gosh, the FAFSA. <laughs> well, uh, let me first say that uh, having twins that went through college at the same time, I don't know if I was more excited that they graduated from college or the fact that I didn't have to fill out that stinking FAFSA anymore. It is hard. It is, it is hard to understand. If you make one little mistake, it kicks it out. So the fact that we are actually focusing as a legislature on making sure that our students are filling it out early is just huge and helping them, helping the parents. I mean, I will tell you the first time I filled it out, I was confused. Someone I worked with, she was helping her son fill it out. She accidentally put her income in his income box because it's just that easy to make that mistake. So they showed that he didn't get, didn't qualify for any um, financial aid. So we know the FAFSA is critically important to make sure that uh, families and students get the financial aid that they deserve, but it is incumbent upon us to make sure they know uh, how to fill that out, that we start early, that we start in high school, so that that's just one less thing that these students and families have to worry about. And if you don't know about the FAFSA and you don't fill it out, you might think that you don't have as much financial aid available to you, and it might be prohibitive. And some parents might not think they can afford to send their child to, to college. So mm -hmm. I love all the work we're doing around that. Um, we've had a couple bills moving uh, this year. Uh, I don't remember where they are in the process, but I, I do hope that we can get those also to the governor's desk because it's critically important that we help the students uh, fill that out. And so with us today, we have community partners, not just K-12 leaders or higher leaders, community partners, what are, and as well as different stakeholders that aren't in maybe in education. What are, what, you know, you're, you're great at calling us to action. What are some of the <laughs> call to actions or ideas or um, ways that they can support this effort for FAFSA completion and California Dream Act completion? Oh gosh, you know, we just get involved and, and hold us accountable. Uh, if you see a gap, let us know because we, as you said, rightly so, Catalina, it's, it's the institution that we don't want letting our young people down. Uh, so our community partners, um, we need your help with our, our community schools, which are amazing. They're doing amazing, amazing work. But without a coordinating body, we just really have to rely on segments to coordinate amongst themselves with high schools. And honestly, it's very inefficient and, and it's ineffective. So I, I think we have to do more at the state level. So kind of transitioning and it, it goes to, um, you know, our conversation with college affordability. And as you know, in California's college, you know, a uh, promise program in our community colleges. And I know there's a lot of conversations going on at the national level about promise programs and free community college. Um, and as you know, in here in our state, our community colleges, and some of them are with us today, um, some of the way they run their promise programs are a little bit, they do them independently. Um, each of them have, you know, academic senates and different bodies within their campuses uh, that help build their promise program. But can you share a little bit about, um, you know, ideas or possibilities to help bring our promise programs together or your thoughts on the promise program in our community colleges to help students um, ensure they, they get the support they need to complete either associates or a transfer coursework or a certificate. Absolutely. I love our College Promise programs. I think that they are amazing. We know that they have shown um, they attract more first-time students to attend uh, college with the promise of the first of free tuition for the first two years is huge. But again, how are we, to, to your point, Catalina, how are we getting that message out there? And I don't know that we're doing a great job of that because I think there's still so many students that don't know about the community pro, um, promise. And and, and how it can really help them. Uh, local control has always been the foundation of how community colleges serve their communities. So I think that that is important to continue to do that. Um, but it's also important for the state to understand how each of these programs is implemented and how local policies affect um, how the students participate in the Promise program. And it would also be useful to know uh, if the progress, the Promise program, uh, such as rates of student persistence, completion, and transfer. So I think that would be helpful to know. We know that it increases first time college students and we know that they it, it helps get them into college, but I would like to know um, what are the, the rates of completion and transfer. I, I would think it's high, but we don't know. And we could be more effective if we, if we do know that. Definitely, so looking to more of a, 
a database for our community colleges to be more, some of that data to be more transparent. And, and what I have found is, you know, it's not a, you know, what's going on, but how do we support? Like you've mentioned repeatedly, like if you need something, tell us. If we, yes. yes, we, we want to advocate. We want to help you get that funding. And when you look at some of the community colleges in Illinois Empire, they continue to serve the students that we've been serving that more than 60, 70% of them, we were feeding them two meals a day. Sometimes yeah. you know, the need is there. And then it's like they graduate, they walk across the stage and not a lot changes over the summer. Right. So then they go to a community college and, and so if their need is there, you want to amplify it to help bring them support so they're successful. Yes, absolutely. No, thank you. And I just, you know, you're like you mentioned a little bit earlier about the, you know, elementary to middle to high to college. And we definitely have to improve that. Um, take it, you know, on holistic of that. Do you have any ideas or thoughts for others here today from community members on how to help support bringing those those groups together in a holistic approach? Yeah, um, anything that we do, we know um, that we need to engage those that are most affected, which would be uh, parents and students. Um, communities and stakeholders must build networks and coalitions to collectively advocate. Um, many currently partner directly with schools and college campuses to bridge the gaps um, between those institutions, uh, such as community-based partners and students and families. Uh, institutions uh, are often faced with the real situations and circumstances that are faced by the, 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 the people that they're actually educating, the students. So we need to be more responsive and employ people um, in positions that are dedicated to connecting the students with these organizations. I mean, I, I, have, uh, I have these dreams that maybe uh, we could have a, a coordinator like that on campus that, you know, I come in, Connie Leva, and I'm like, you know, I really want to go come to school here, but, you know, I don't have uh, access to get here. So, oh, great, here, we can get you a bus pass. Or, you know, how do we make sure that the that students know that there are actually programs out there um, to help them? A lot of our campuses are already doing that, but I want to make sure that we're doing it um, everywhere and at all of our campuses. I know some elementary schools offer a parent university uh, where parents can learn about the K through 12 system and then post-secondary opportunities. But that, again, you know, we have 1,037, 1,037 school districts in the state of California, and we know that's not happening in every district. So how do we make sure that we are educating the parents? But then I will go back to how do we get that information to parents when they're working two and three jobs? How do we, you know, if we if we have in-person meetings, once that's allowed again, and we're, we're in a better way, um, but do we also, also offer it online? And how do we, how do we make sure we make the information accessible? I think, and I think that's always going to be a challenge uh, coming out of the labor movement. We were always talking about how do we educate our members and make sure they know about their their rights and their you know that they have in the contract. So I think we're always going to be faced with that challenge. But I think we just have to always keep trying to move the ball forward and and just figuring out different ways to make sure parents know what opportunities are out there. Well, and I think you you've all different opportunities, different events and areas I've seen. You're really you're a huge advocate for. Um, not making decisions for people without people, without the, without yes. the, yes. <laughs> so, and, and so I think that's encouraging. I've been in meetings where we want to do something, let's say for teachers or for um, parents, and it's like, there's not a parent at the table. Or right, table. yes. And I think that's the first, when we're, the, even the students, you know, student voice is so powerful and doing empathy interviews with students to find out. And I think that's, um, I've watched your team do is include, include, different stakeholders to hear their voice and, and have it, you know, their voice at the table instead of making a decision for them without them. Thank, thank you for saying that, Catalina, because it is so true. I know I don't know everything. My team knows we don't know everything. So when we're trying to engage parents, you know, we're going to talk to the parents and say, what is the best way to outreach to you? You know, everybody uh, has one of these now. So maybe it is text messaging or whatnot. But you're right. If we're going to make decisions, the people we're making the decisions about have to be at the table. Totally agree. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, I guess I've, I've, your team has done a great job of including different stakeholders to get that information, um, you as well. So I want to shift a little bit to talking about California budget priorities and, and funding. And I think one thing I've noticed in the last few years, um, you know, with you know, uh, the conversations around P20 data with Governor Newsom's focus on P20 data systems and the legislature and yourself, really looking at California from a whole, from a 
a whole piece, P20, not just, you know, right. buckets. And so as, you know, we continue to, to um, move things, for example, in Riverside County, you know, we've really pushed so much on um, college enrollment and FAFSA completion and all of our efforts working together with um, our court systems and so many different groups coming together, things like the juvenile felony arrest rate has lessened, it's declined. Yeah. And so sometimes we, we get so, we're so busy doing the day-to-day, -day, we don't stop and reflect and say, hey, we actually could shift resources from this to that. And, and I think the P20 conversation um, you're having has really opened up those ideas. Like we're thinking about one affects the other, the housing affects the college enrollment or the college enrollment affects obviously the income of how much you know, Pell Grant federal dollars is coming to a community. So you're in that day-to-day, -day, you understand that. So what, can you share a little bit about your thoughts or ideas about how systems or instant business, even nonprofits can look at what's happening and use that data to kind of change their efforts? Yes. Oh, that's such a, a good question because it's, it's a good question and it's a difficult question because I think what you're suggesting is a very healthy approach to budgeting. Um, and I always say that our budget reflects our priorities, uh, but when we see money in one area um, not needed as much, it is very difficult to move it uh, someplace else. Um, and we cannot leave it to individual departments to shift funds to each other. It really would come from the governor's office. And we've seen him do some of that um, just recently this year. The other challenge would be um, the difficulty of moving um, Prop 98 to non-Prop um, 98 uh, programs, moving those monies around. But I think the point you bring up is is really important, Catalina, that we, are we using our money effectively? Are we using it efficiently? Are we using it in a way that best benefits our students, our young people? So I think those are things that we need to look at. Um, they're just not quite as easy as we would like them to be. When I was running for office, people were like, oh, government moves slowly. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm very efficient. When I get there, mm -mm, we're going to get things done. Well, I'm here to say government moves slowly but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at exactly what you said and figure out where is that money best going to be spent because after all this is taxpayer money and we want to make sure we are spending it as wisely as possible awesome thank you and i think it goes to you know you're a huge focus you you and your team have have pushed is you know showing like return on investment you know yes. so you're able to not just, yes, you want to save that student in San Bernardino County or Riverside County, that family, and you are so passionately advocating for them, but you also know we have to show the return on investment for every student. So can you share a little bit, I think, you know, when, when the FAFSA for all conversations ha happened and how do we help, and there's been some naysayers, I don't think that that should happen, and Alone, you have shown, you know, the California State Aid Commission has shared and shown we leave millions of dollars of federal dollars on the table that could come to the state just by students that are already in community college or a four year institution, UCC issue by doing their, their application. So, can you give anything else you'd like to share a little bit about or, or give examples for those maybe naysayers today watching or not understanding what the impact of a Cal Grant funding does for our state and our communities and ideas on how maybe we can continue to show that impact that it's more than just we paid for tuition. Right. For impacts myself, I was a Cal Grant recipient. I received a Cal Grant. I can assure everyone watching that I've paid back 10 times the amount that I received as a first generation college student in California in tax and state taxes. Can you share a little bit about that, Senator Leva? Absolutely. You're right on, Catalina. Receiving a Cal Grant can be life-changing for people. I, too, was a first time um, in my first person in my family to graduate college. Getting a Cal Grant for me was life-changing. I was working full-time, putting myself through college, and getting that Cal Grant and knowing that that chunk of money, it's been so long, I don't remember how much it was, um, <laughs> but getting that chunk of money and knowing that I didn't have to take out a loan, knowing I didn't have to put money out of my paycheck away for that, it truly was life-changing. And we know that when college is affordable, we put more people into the workforce and people who are working are getting a paycheck and they're spending money in our, um, in our communities. Uh, I, you know, I always, I like to tell people one person 
uh, if you give them a little extra money, most of your average people aren't going to put that into savings, which, you know, I mean, that's another conversation, but they're going to go spend that at the grocery store. They're going to spend it to go out to eat. They're going to spend it on a haircut or a pair of shoes. And it's just going to continue to make the economy move forward. Um, we can look at changes in numbers and demographics of Calgary recipients. I think that's one thing we can use to measure uh, success. If, you know, we always have our numbers, people who want, you know, the actual numbers. But I'm more of a, uh, I don't know what the word is, but I think you can see it in what people do. Uh, look at you and I. Both of us have gone on to have uh, good careers. And in, in large part, that's because we were able to go to college and college was affordable for us uh, and partially through the Cal Grant program. So the more we can help people uh, complete college and not be saddled with so much debt, uh, because that's another problem. Okay, you might get your degree, but if you're saddled with all of this debt, then you're not spending money in the community that you live in. You're trying to pay down that debt. You're not going to be able to afford to buy a home. So uh, yes, there are always naysayers, but we will prove to them that uh, that they're wrong in this instance and that Cal Grants are life-changing for people and communities. Thank you. And I think, you know, we're all community members here today watching and listening. And, you know, it, it's so, it's been such an honor to just to w work with you and your team. And I know the Student Aid Commission is just, you know, we can do this without you. And, and, but that's just it, more of us need to get involved and help support you and work with you and, and, and be able to advocate and, and not just, you know, Senator Leva's taking care of it. We need to get involved with <laughs> community members. And I've heard that, oh, she's on it, you know? And it's like, I know, but how do we help her? What do we do? Do we go talk? Do we go present? What do we do to help her champion what she's doing? So please give us a laundry list. Um, of what we need to do as community members to be engaged and to help support some of these big initiatives that will do life-changing initiatives that you're championing for our state and our students. Thank you, Catalina. And I love that people think that I'm on it because I am trying to be on it. I'm trying not to miss anything, but I can be more effective. My team can be more effective with all of our community stakeholders, uh, with parents involved, with community organizations involved. And part of that is if you are a parent and your child is in school right now, you know exactly what is going on. You are the boots on the ground. I would love to see you at, well, again, this is hard, but at um, school board meetings, if you hear something, um, I would love to hear from you and tell me what you're hearing. Because, you know, a lot of times we we do things here in Sacramento and we, um, we put the money there and we budget things for different programs, but we don't always hear back on how it's actually working on the ground. So tell me if it's not working. Um, meet with me, meet with my staff, meet with all your legislators, because and you can meet in the district, you can do a phone call, you can do an email, you can do a letter. There's so many ways to contact us um, because we need to hear from you um, because not everyone is equally involved. And also some people need to have a little push to get them to do the right thing. So please let us know what's going on. Um, you know, for me personally, I love to speak to PTA groups um, that have a lot of parents and hear from them what is happening, go to high schools and speak to them, hear from students students who are at our community colleges and at our CSUs and UCs so that I can be a better, uh, a better advocate for you and a better legislator. But I think the most important thing you can do is stay involved to whatever degree you can. There are some people who will have more time. There will some people who have less time. And I just wouldn't want anyone to ever think that because they don't have a lot of time, oh, I, I don't really have as much time. I shouldn't be involved. And also to think that your opinion and your voice isn't valuable. We need to hear from everyone. So reach out to us. Um, let me know how I can be helpful, how my team can be helpful. And, uh, and remember, we're no different from you. Legislators aren't scary. We're just regular people and we're trying to do the right thing. So help us do the right thing. No, thank you for that message. And I think someone just, you know, recently experiencing just some of the, I'm still learning every day about, you know, policies and how they work and Sacramento. And, and, and I think it's, it can be overwhelming, but one thing I've learned is there's so much power in the experiences that you know someone brings as an educator, as a mom, as a, a stay-at-home mom that's you know do maybe homeschooling their children. Yeah. Like those those experiences help you and your team make stronger choices on policy. Yes, and so I think I, I just cannot go enough. Um, I'm like I'm, I was just a teacher, or I was just a counselor, but if, oh yeah, you yeah. you have so many different experiences that 
and make things stronger for, for the work you're doing for us. So, you know, the theme of, of the convening is, you know, brighter future, a brighter future awaits. And I know, um, you, you know, you know, our Inland Empire, you know, both Riverside and San Bernardino counties and the work that happens, the, in, the school dependent students we have. So I want to give you this opportunity and time to do what you do best and just leave us with words of inspiration and hope to ensure our students here have a brighter future. Thank you, Catalina. Uh, so what I would say is that education is the great equalizer. Uh, people tend to think that our children who live in uh, communities that are maybe a little bit more affluent are smarter. And I just think that is 1000% not true. Poor kids are smart too. They just might not have the opportunities that other students have. So I really view my job here uh, in the legislature is how do I make sure, how do I, while I have the five years I hopefully have left, how do I make sure that every student reaches their fullest potential? And we do that uh, through equality, or not equality, through equity, making sure each student has what they need. And that's the fun part about my job. Uh, and we talk about experience. And I always tell people, I don't ever think I was a bad senator, but being in the Senate now for seven years, I'm a better senator because I'm a little smarter. And everyone brings something to the table. And I just feel so passionate that I want to make sure every single one of our students has that opportunity to be who they were meant to be. We were all put on this earth for a reason. And we, as the adults, need to make sure we help them reach, um, achieve that, uh, that their potential. And they're going to change the world. World. When I go out and speak to our students, I always tell them, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's on you guys. You are our future leaders. You have to unscrew up the world that we adults have screwed up. So study hard, do everything you need to do, uh, graduate from high school, and then either go to college or to a trade school and be the best person you can be in your community. I will do my part here with all of you, uh, and we will, we will make this world a better place. We can do it if we all work together. Thank you so much. On you know behalf of the GIA team and California Student Aid Commission, Riverside County Office of Education, I just have to just thank you for your work. And you are our relentless advocate, our relentless champion, our college affordability champion. And I do know you every day. You're working for students of California, and and um, we will be the best in the nation. We are amazing already, but we will get that highest vessel rate. In the, in the nation. So I know you, I know you want to see that too. Yeah. Uh, but just thank you so much for your work and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having me, Catalina. And thank you to everyone who's watching. Keep up the good work. We're all in this together. We'll make a difference together. Well, thank you so much, Senator Leva and Catalina for the great conversation you gave us today. I know I certainly am inspired by your words. And as you all know, things can move quickly in Sacramento. One of the bills that Senator Leva has been championing, uh, AB 1456 around Cal Grant access has passed the legislature and is currently on the governor's desk. Uh, GIA continues to support this legislation, has sent several letters in that support. And so, you know, we recommend that you continue to do the same as well with your organizations to support these pieces of legislation that are so important for our students. As we conclude our sessions today, I'd like to take a, a minute to look back at some of the great uh, presentations and areas that we talked about over the course of this conference. You know, we're really excited to ensure that we provide over these two days really useful tools and resources and information that you all can use uh, back with your work, as well as some inspiration, given that we all have uh, had such a crazy time over the last, you know, 18, 20 months, and it continues, right? And we're all working together, as Senator Leva said, to really ensure that education is the great equalizer. Uh, one of the notes from our keynote yesterday with uh, Leona Christie from Catalyst Ed, she mentioned, you know, four key takeaways as leaders that we need to ensure we use over the course of, of our work and making sure that we take care of our people, that we let our values guide us, that we are able to share our power, right, working collaboratively with each other, and that we balance both the short-term goals and the long-term goals. 
And we at GIA are here to support all of you in that work, as well as I know many members of the network continuing to work through the Action Network teams and many other organizations that are network focused throughout the region to ensure that we align around similar goals and make sure that, that we are here to help support our students and families moving forward. Carlos Ayala, the president and CEO of GIA mentioned yesterday as well, really calling us to action to both think and act regionally in all of our work. And so it, with that, I want to extend a huge thanks to all of the speakers who shared their goals and ideas for the region. We were very fortunate to have many speakers from all of the various partners and um, they will have their presentations available, continue to be available in Attendify. And so we will also have recordings of those presentations. So those will also be added to Attendify that you all will have access to very soon uh, to make sure that, you know, if you had to step away for a while, you will still be able to have that access. In addition, I would really like to thank the GIA team. I am fortunate to work with an amazing group of people and this convening could not have taken place without all of them. So thank you for all your hard work in making this happen. And then of course, behind the scenes, all of our logistics is handled uh, by designing events and they are amazing to work with. So thank you so much for your time and energy uh, as we continue to um, move forward in our region. We couldn't do it with, without all of you, of course. So a huge thanks to all of you for sticking with us and um, learning and growing and continuing to share your knowledge and your wisdom uh, with all of the rest of us in, in your great work uh, towards uh, building a bright future for all of our students. And so with that, what I would like to do is um, post our uh, survey. Of course, at the end of any conference, there is a survey. And we would ask you if you could to please take this conference survey uh, right now. We will um, sign off and have DJ Steve close out the session uh, while you take this survey, uh, because we want to know your feedback as we'll continue to do conferences and workshops like this in the future and um, need your feedback to make sure that it's a useful and enjoyable experience for all of you. So once again, thank you so much for attending. We've really appreciated your time and entering into your space over the last couple of days and look forward to continuing to work with all of you in the future. Take it away, DJ Steve.
Tessa, I have your presentation up. Would you like me to share? And that would be fantastic since we're having total systems meltdown over here. Yeah, I would love that. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Let me stop sharing and then I will present based on your screen. There we go.